Okay, here we go. My favorite Star Wars movie and my favorite movie of all time. It's time for the big one. The big one. The, the big, big one. one. What is the big one? Revenge of the Sith, ladies and gents. The most underrated Star Wars movie at the time is now finally getting the respect it deserves through time. The Disney disasters have given prequel fans a leg to stand on and say, were those movies really that bad? And now I'm going to have to convince you that Revenge of the Sith is better than all three of the original trilogy combined times six. Revenge of the Sith is the best movie in the series. Fuck Empire Strikes Back, this is the best one. Not only did this film cap off the prequel trilogy, but it also led directly into A New Hope, since this is where George Lucas had to connect all the dots for continuity's sake. Best damn film in the series. For this review, we'll be doing the same thing. We'll be scoring each aspect out of 10, but expect unending praise for this movie. Now let's do this. Any low attention span prequel haters should shut the fuck up about this movie and give George some credit. It starts with all out warfare. General Grievous and Count Dooku have kidnapped Chancellor Palpatine and Obi-Wan and Anakin have to step in to save him. We get some nice banter that shows how much the two have developed since Attack of the Clones. Anakin and Obi-Wan make their way to Grievous' ship and locates Palpatine, where we meet Count Dooku once again. I've been looking forward to this. This movie was essentially The Last Jedi if it was good. The Last Jedi tried to be a deep, dark, and thought-provoking story but failed miserably. We get our first taste of themes when Anakin is confronted with a choice after he disarms Dooku. Palpatine orders Anakin to kill Dooku, and Anakin decides to slice his head off. We all know that Vader will become Darth Vader in this movie. And fronted with the other two movies in this trilogy, this movie builds up to a payoff better than anything else. Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Palpatine attempt to escape, but are captured by General Grievous. After Obi-Wan and Anakin retrieve their lightsabers, Grievous escapes and forces Anakin and Obi-Wan to control the crash landing of his ship. What was that about this movie being boring again? This is the most eventful Star Wars movie in existence. This is the most ambitious film in the series. Again, fuck The Last Jedi. Afterwards, Anakin and Obi-Wan celebrate, and even better for Anakin, Padme tells him that she's pregnant. But uh-oh, Anakin has a dream about Padme can dying with Obi-Wan at her side. This is where he starts to freak out. In Attack of the Clones, he told Padme he wanted the power to save people from dying. What's worse, the only information he knows of that he could read is locked in the Jedi Archives reserved for Council members only. But in classic Mace Windu fashion, he denies him the rank of Master. Another thing, this movie is so damn quotable. The dialogue is the best of the series. Lines like, do it, and I have the high ground, among dozens of other lines of memes. Well done, George. Story gets to a darker turn. Despite the Jedi not granting him the rank of Master, they still expect him to spy on his friend Palpatine, while Obi-Wan is sent to find and destroy Grievous. Anakin talks about the dark side with Palpatine, where he tells him the Sith legend of Darth Plagueis the Wise. It's not a story those pesky Jedi would tell you. You can feel Anakin turning as the movie goes on. On Obi-Wan's side, he hunts down Grievous, relying on his arrogance to jump down and say, Hello there. Obi-Wan manages to kill the so uncivilized leader of the Separatist army. The Clone Wars is pretty much at its end, but it won't end happily as we all know. Anakin learns that Palpatine is the Sith Lord. I never thought this plot twist was meant to be shocking. It's more like a twist where you wait for the characters to realize Palpatine is the Sith Lord. I wasn't groaning out loud. Anakin is conflicted at this point. He informs Master Windu about Palpatine's status as a Sith, but he tells Anakin to piss off away from big boy Jedi affairs, further making Anakin doubt the Jedi Council. Mace and the boys confront Palpatine, to which Palpatine swings a lightsaber and kills three Jedi with ease, but Mace manages to defeat him. Anakin decides he can't let the Jedi kill his only known source to obtaining life-saving powers, so he stops right about at Palpatine's office. With Palpatine on the floor begging for his life and Mace Windu ignoring Anakin's request for Palpatine to stand trial, Anakin makes a split-second decision to save the rightfully elected leader of the Republic, but in doing so, cutting off Mace's hand. In an agonizing, brutal scene, 
Palpatine shocks Mace with lightning till he flies out the window to his death. Anakin is dumbfounded with what he's done, and he knows he cannot go back now. His only choice now is to embrace the dark side, even if his friend Obi-Wan is still a Jedi. Anakin, contrary to popular belief, does not decide this easily, but what to keep in mind is that the Jedi treated him like dog shit since his initiation, and even Obi-Wan didn't respect him at first, treating him like a rebellious teenage son. I'm not one to preach about themes, but this is where The Last Jedi could have taken some inspiration, because how this story conveys themes is perfect. Essentially stuff like how everything is not black and white, Jedi and the Sith can be very similar in many different circumstances. Darth Plagueis as described in Palpatine's story, had his power so he could save the ones he cared about from dying. This also questions the Jedi's morality, as Mace refuses to adhere to the Jedi Code when he tries to execute the Chancellor without a trial, and the justification he gives is that Palpatine will never face conventional justice. He must be killed now. With Anakin's turn to the dark side, Palpatine orders him to wipe out the Jedi at the temple, and then go to the Mustafar system to wipe out the Separatists. In a painfully depressing sequence, the Jedi are wiped out with the only two relevant survivors being Master Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi. They have plot armor, so the film has to find a way to convincingly spare their lives for continuity's sake. And the explanation we get is perfect. Yoda senses Order 66 before he's targeted, and Obi-Wan only narrowly escapes. Yoda and Obi-Wan meet up and go to the Jedi Temple. Obi-Wan sends a message not to return to the temple, and they discover the truth behind the purge. Anakin has fallen to the dark side. Yoda and Obi-Wan must face the Sith for the sake of the galaxy. Obi-Wan opts to go face Palpatine, but Yoda tells him he is not strong enough. He will face the Emperor while Obi-Wan is forced to face his former apprentice. In an even more depressing note, Palpatine declares the Republic's transition into an Empire to overwhelmingly positive reception, where Anakin also brutally kills the Separatists. Obi-Wan speaks to Padme about Anakin's transition to a Sith, and states that he has seen security footage of him killing the younglings, the children of the Jedi. Padme then decides to look for Anakin. She tracks him down to Mustafar, to where he killed the Separatists, but unfortunately for everything, Obi-Wan snuck inside Padme's ship and then he decides to reveal himself at the absolute worst time. Anakin ends up choking his wife unconscious, and former master and apprentice have their confrontation. Coinciding with this is Yoda confronting Emperor Palpatine. In a devastating turn, Yoda loses to Palpatine and Anakin loses to Obi-Wan. However, all four survive, but Anakin is engulfed in flames as Obi-Wan leaves him to die. For his movie that is meant to answer all the questions, the film explains everything efficiently. We see how Vader burned and why he didn't die despite that. As afterwards, Palpatine recovers his apprentice and puts him through painful surgery into a suit that we all recognize. As Obi-Wan helps Padme give birth to twins, Luke and Leia, she dies shortly after from unknown causes. Luke goes to Tatooine to his family as Obi-Wan looks over him and Leia goes to Alderaan as Bail Organa decides to adopt her. As the film ends, the galaxy is at the brink of darkness, and the good guys are at their lowest point. The end. So, so yeah, this is the greatest story ever told. This story is ambitious, daring, and essential. Everything the sequel trilogy wasn't. It had the weight of wrapping up the trilogy and it succeeded. 10 points to the story. It's a masterpiece, best damn prequel ever, better than Red Dead Redemption 2. Also, Kashyyyk isn't fan service, it's world building to show us more of the Clone Wars. Best Damn Shots of the Saga This movie truly emphasized visual storytelling. This is the movie to watch if you want to watch a movie in the middle of the night and you have to put it to minimum volume. This film is shot like a work of art. Exceptional shorts include the whole movie, the whole movie, the whole movie, and last but not least, the whole movie. Everything is shot so well, you could pause at any time and make an excellent oil painting out of it. Everything is shot well, you get a look of everything relevant on screen, so many memorable shots. My favourite has to be the shot of Obi-Wan and Anakin struggling with each other on Mustafa. Along with the pouring lava, this piece of spectacle is symbolic to the fight itself.
People argue that we didn't need the spectacle, and to those people we say, fuck off, the fight was amazing. The editing is superb, the film is paced perfectly, every scene is weaved in perfectly, and considering this movie has the most plot out of all the Star Wars movies, and had the challenge of tying everything together, it's quite impressive how effectively everything was connected. The film manages to give itself the right amount of exposition for it to not be overwhelming, and coupled with the visual storytelling we get enough information. I hope you enjoy the world building because it's probably the last time in a while that we'll get it, because the sequels didn't take any notes from this movie. Anyways, the reason why everything is so well paced is because it has all essential information. I don't even think the ending is rushed. It felt more like leaving threads open which is desirable for external source material, but we get enough that we don't rely on non-credible inference. Based on how George edited the movie and the hordes of deleted scenes, I think we were very lucky with the version we got. I'm going to give 10 points to the cinematography slash editing. Better than reality, this film has some of the most impressive digital effects of the last 100 years. If only the people who innovated on special effects in silent films could see how far our effects would go. People do not give the effects enough credit when it's due. Rendering so many realistic looking spaceships and crap on screen takes a lot of work. This is one of the few things Cosmonaut gave the prequels credit for, but special effects does not equal quality, so that was a safe thing to praise while still trashing the prequels. And when I said better than reality, I mean it. It doesn't look like a video game, it looks like a fully realized world with so much character, and the effects are not too clean. This is the galaxy far far away, and the locations chosen are places of importance. Don't you think they'd have to be able to maintain sanitation? Anyways, when it comes to the visual design, it's the best there was, the best there is, and the best there ever will be. It's an excellent look to an already phenomenal film. The characters look the best they ever were. The upgraded clone troopers specifically just make the film so sellable. If the original trilogy didn't have the advantage of being older, Revenge of the Sith would have sold the most toys in its entire lifetime. The costumes like the Phantom Menace assist the storytelling. All the new clone designs tells you that the war is in its late stages. This film looks bloody amazing. The new locations we get, even the ones that appear for a few seconds, are fan favorites. A lot of them are probably green screened because Revenge of the Sith represents hard work and digital effects. Mustafar is the most dynamic, most interesting location in the film. Every location is a joy to watch. I'm going to give 10 points to the visual design. Hayden Christensen plays Anakin Skywalker. For his last big film role, Hayden Christensen brings on his S game. He's at his best in the visual acting. Looking at his expressions makes it obvious why George chose him, but when it comes to his line delivery, aside from maybe one or two questionable deliveries, he excels at everything else. This should most certainly quiet the dickheads who said Hayden sucked as an actor. Ewan McGregor plays Obi-Wan Kenobi. Goddamn next to Palpatine, his line delivery is the most quotable. McGregor's natural charisma brings a lot to the role. He has a suave persona about him. He is damn the most likable character in the movie because of this. Scenes where he gets emotional are also well done. The best in the industry. Frankly, I'm surprised that McGregor doesn't appear in even more movies. Ian McDermott comes back to play Palpatine. Ian is like McGregor as in the fact that his line delivery is simply perfect. He's written like an over-the-top bad guy, and McDermott doesn't shy away from that. He brings on the ultimate bad guy persona. Even things like the cackle is worth putting in videos. And McDermott doesn't shy away from that, so the way he's directed is perfect. Natalie Portman plays Senator Padme Amidala. Her role in this movie is scaled back compared to the other two movies, but for an understandable reason. Despite the limited screen presence, Portman gives the best emotion when the story goes down a dark path, and I have no idea why people say she was wooden. It's fucking perfect. Frank Oz voices Yoda. Somehow Frank turned a fucking puppet into the greatest, most dynamic midget in a film. Size matters not, and Yoda was absolutely a treat. Frank Oz cracks zero jokes throughout the whole movie, even with his ridiculous character voice, and for that, I have to give him the Golden Star treatment. Samuel L. Jackson plays Mace Windu. His performance is great, he's a badass, and we all know he had to die. 
We knew Mace Windu would be the perfect point for Anakin to fall to the dark side. His strongest points come in his final moments. Seeing his sheer determination to kill the Sith Lord given Jackson's expressions says a thousand words. It's one of the greatest death scenes in the history of film. I'm going to give 9.5 points to the acting. Best Damn Soundtrack Since this was confirmed to be the last Star Wars movie ever at the time, John Williams brought on everything he had, every song, every composition, is the best there was, the best there is, and the best there ever will be. John Williams takes on all emotions. The music playing during Order 66 made me fucking cry. This, alongside Unshaken from Red Dead Redemption 2, could make any death scene sad. Battle of the Heroes is the greatest song in the whole series. Cutting in between the light and the dark, between Master and Apprentice, and the Dark Lord vs Jedi Grandmaster. This battle, despite being in a prequel, determines the fate of everything, and ties up every loose end there ever could be, and the music does its part perfectly. Even the least remarkable scenes have excellent music, from beginning to end. The soundtrack is something I would buy if I was into CDs and whatnot. It's the best soundtrack I have heard in a long time. As for the normal sounds, they are used to its full advantage and they have an interesting story to them. Take Grievous's coughing for example. That was actually the man, the myth, the legend, George Lucas himself while he had an illness. And the clarity is once again, spectacular. Every sound effect is used at the exact right time. It's breathtaking. And this makes the sound, a very important part of Star Wars, the best it ever has been. I'm going to give 10 points to the music slash sound. Best damn film in the series. This film deserves even more love. And I admire how more and more people are labeling Revenge of the Sith as their favorite. George obviously wanted the series to end on a high note, since it was pretty much the last true and authentic Star Wars movie before the dark times, before Disney. After this, there was only seven years of peace. Then 2012 happened. The Mayan calendar might have been wrong about the world ending, but what George decided to do might as well have been just as bad. Disney is growing to own pretty much everything at this point. They bought Fox for fuck's sake. But even then, it was a 10 long year wait before the next movie came out. But that's a story for another time. Revenge of the Sith has earned a total of 49.5 points out of 50, equaling a 9.9 .9 out of 10 score. The only other way that any Star Wars movie could beat Revenge of the Sith is being made by George Lucas. I don't think any movie can exceed this movie. It's just perfect. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories for mystery boxes?